Uh, yes, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much to the organisers and the Society of Endocrinology for this enormous privilege and honour and come to speak to you today. Uh, it's been a wonderful program, and I very much enjoyed the atmosphere and collegiality of the Society. As uh, uh, Chris indicated, I started uh, as an endocrinologist, uh, did a PhD, actually in the early inhibin days in the female, and then uh, having done a postdoc in the US, became interested in the male reproductive system, which has been a tremendously rewarding uh, aspect uh, for my life. And uh, to the aspect that I'm going to talk about today is fertility regulation. I do this because uh, it's both an area of fascinating biology, uh, both uh, basic and, and clinical. The disorders we have here are prevalent and burdensome. And it's a, been an area that's seen tremendous advances in our understanding and our ability to intervene and to manage patient outcomes. It's an absorbing area, uh, covering basic science, clinical science, right through to politics and bioethics, uh, interacting as we do with urologists and gynaecologists as well as internal med medical people. So I, as I, in my words, it's the, it's the gift that keeps on giving in terms of, of a, a career involvement. Now, I'd like to... Uh, uh, acknowledge, if I, I might, uh, at the very beginning, some of the most important people in my life. Uh, that is the people at uh, Prince Henry's Institute uh, and Monash University. I'd highlight David Robertson, the discoverer of inhibin, and Professors Berger and de Kretzer, some of Australia's most preeminent em uh, uh, endocrinologists who have been tremendously influential uh, in giving me opportunity after opportunity. I've also had important collaborations in Sydney with David Handelsman, the United States with Bill Bremner and Peter Schlegel, and I'm grateful to many of the funding bodies, both national and international, uh, that have uh, really helped me come to the positions that I'm talking about today. So I'm going to talk about the HPT axis and the way we can manipulate it. Uh, of course, it uh, fundamentally depends upon uh, GnRH secretion, uh, engendering pituitary gonadotropin release, and the testis here uh, responds by providing us with fertility and virility. The two things, of course, are different, although they can uh, be affected in the one individual. In turn, there is regulation of the axis by testosterone and estradiol, and inhibin and the active and follistatin family in terms of FSH. So the relevance of this system is that we can manipulate it for pro-fertility reasons, to initiate or restore FSH and androgen action on the seminiferous tubule in the management of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, henceforth referred to as HH, uh, and also I want to talk a little bit about idiopathic uh, male infertility. And then the other side, of course, is contraception, where we can exploit the negative sex hormone feedback relationships to deprive the epithelium for the reason, of course, of male hormonal contraception. So these are the three areas I'm going to talk about today. From the pro-fertility point of view, our ambition, of course, is to restore natural fertility. And there is both evidence-based use, use of treatments and also a fair amount of empirical usage I'll touch on. And all of this is now uh, overarched by the advances in assisted reproduction. So the achievement I'd like to highlight, I guess, from the outset is the way we've been able to improve our understanding of biology and treatment that's translating into improved clinical care. In the, in the context of HH, of course, we're talk, we are talking about disorders which can be permanent or temporary, and that must be contrasted with primary testicular failure, which, of course, is the commonest cause of male subfertility. But they differ in one important way. Uh, HH is eminently treatable in the genuine sense that we aim to restore natural fertility, whilst in the context of primary testicular disease, we don't treat, we manage through assisted reproduction very often. So that's uh, more than a semantic difference. It really reflects our understanding here and our ignorance down here. In terms of the causes of HH, they are, they are uh, manifold. Uh, they can be specific to the GnRH deficiency system, most notably congenital Kalman syndrome uh, and its variants. They can be combined with other pituitary hormone deficiencies <coughs> or induced by drugs such as opiates <coughs> and antipsychotics in particular. Of course, we also have gonadotropin deficiency at the pituitary level with structural lesions such as prolactinoma, adenoma, hemorrhage, surgery, and the like. Sex steroid suppression by androgen use or misuse. And also sex steroid secreting neoplasia, an uncommon but important cause. And finally, functional disorders such as chronic illness and morbid obesity. This is a case of Kalman syndrome. And I make um, a point here that this is a severe case with very small testes, and clearly this uh, adolescent is uh, completely uh, under-virilized. And he has small testes, and it's important to realize that his testes have never seen the prenatal and postnatal gonadotropin surge, which we all normally experience. So the infrastructure of his testis 
really can never be normal. He has missed the opportunity to develop Sertoli cell and seminiferous tubule uh, development potential that he would have uh, had had he not had that uh, congenital defect. And of course, the aim of treatment is generally in this, such adolescence is to uh, restore the natural pubertal pr progression and cause virilization. And ever, if ever a picture can tell a thousand words, this is in fact the process of virilization in this individual. But throughout, with the, with the administration of testosterone, his testes remain small, spermatogenesis is inactive, and if one was to biopsy his testis, they would just show some primary gonocytes and not much else. So our achievement uh, in these sorts of cases is firstly the understanding we now have of genotype-phenotype relationships in congenital HH. And the physiology of both normal and disordered puberty has been revealed by the identification of numerous genes involved in the development of the normal uh, HPT axis. Uh, here a review from a couple of years ago highlighting the fact that you can uh, differentiate uh, two sort of clinical syndromes, one where uh, olfaction is normal, normosmic HH, or those with impaired uh, sense of smell, classically Kalman syndrome. And these are numerous genes that have been identified from family studies of, of such people with disordered uh, pubertal development, cryptorganism and the like. And uh, long story short, these genes uh, come uh, uh, with uh, burdens in terms of generate secretion or action, or in the case of Kalman syndrome, generate neuronal migration from the olfactory placoid back into the uh, hypothalamus. So we understand a great deal uh, about uh, the role of these genes now in both disordered and normal puberty. The second achievement we can be proud of is the understanding we now have of what requires to establish and maintain normal sperm production. And really this is uh, 40 or 50 years worth of work here of, of thousands of people around the world using animal models and clinical models to understand what's actually driving the process and how it can be manipulated. Uh, we have been particularly interested in the translational aspects of this and the performance of clinical studies uh, in humans and um, we have used what we call the vasectomy model uh, which is one in which very generous Australian men uh, donate a small fragment of their testis for our research and these gentlemen have undergone experimental gonadotropin suppression and replacement followed to previously planned vasectomy and with these testicular biopsy tissue we can undertake testicular steroid measurement and importantly, look at the actual germ cell dynamics, the transition from spermatogonia through to sp spermatids uh, in a times uh, and uh, quantitative way. And this has allowed us to understand what are the critical determinants of sperm production. Uh, long story very short is that, as I mentioned to you before, it's important that you have a fetal, neonatal and pubertal gonadotropin uh, surges <clears throat> in order to develop the full potential of the testis and its, its uh, important infrastructure. Uh, under the influence of LH, testicular testosterone <clears throat> made by the Leydig cells results in levels of, <clears throat> testos of uh, testosterone in the testis which are 100-fold higher than that in the serum. And this very high level of androgen bathes the seminiferous tubules and acts <clears throat> via specific receptors in Sertoli cells whilst FSH also acts on Sertoli cells to <coughs> allow the uh, mitosis, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> mitosis of spermatogonia, then the meiosis of spermatocytes, uh, and then the uh, prolonged process of spermatid uh, development from a round to a, a tailed spermatid or an elongated spermatid and the final release. Now this process is breathtakingly effective. Uh, it takes about 60 to 70 days for various species to go from the bottom to the top and the adult human male, uh, when fully underway, produces 1,000 sperm every heartbeat. That is a truly staggering statistic and talks about the efficiency uh, of, of the process. And by, in terms of animals, that's actually not very good. The achievement that we have is that we can now uh, administer the correct agents to allow men with HH to father their own children naturally or assisted reproduction. And these treatments are convenient, accessible and easily monitored. And in, uh, in, in brief form, uh, what one is seeking to do is to uh, induce what these men have never had before, that is a high level of intratesticular testosterone is the first step. 
We do this by administering HCG, not LH, because LH is too expensive uh, and has too short a half-life to be clinically useful in this context. So HCG injections twice a week are very effective, and one monitors, of course, semen quality, testis volume, and testosterone. And in some individuals, that will, will initiate the process. But in many with the more severe forms, you have to add FSH as well. Yeah, this is a three times a week uh, administration, and that will uh, restore some degree of sperm production, often in three uh, months or even two years. It is a long process, uh, as I think you'd fairly say, is this normal puberty. It's not something one can achieve in a short time frame. And what's interesting is that natural fertility in such uh, men occurs with quite low sperm densities. Sperm densities are perhaps five million per mil, which is a, a third the lower limit of the normal male range. Basically, the sperm these men make are very good quality sperm. So it's, it's something that we can really uh, aim to achieve in the majority of cases. There are some negative prognostic factors uh, for a poorer outcome. One is to have a very small testis to begin with, and that comes back to the point I made about having poor uh, prenatal infrastructure establishment, which limits the potential of the testis. The history of cryptorchidism is a, a, a poor a factor, either due to a vascular insufficiency from the surgery uh, or an intrinsic uh, somatogenic defect. And if genotyping is to be performed, and that, I guess that's only in specialised centres, the Cal gene uh, defects carry a poorer outcome. Overall, I think, from this very large number of studies, we can say that in three quarters of prepubertal cases and the great majority of postpubertal cases, we can restore natural fertility. Sometimes in the adult cases, simple HCG alone is all that's required because having matured the testis uh, prior to the onset of their illness, uh, the testis can respond simply to HCG without the need for additional FSH. Therapeutically, we have to understand these outcomes are actually poorer than what they, they currently are because these references all uh, predate the invention of microinjection IVF, which now has lowered the threshold substantially, basically down to just a few sperm. And one sees a number of patients in whom after two years uh, of therapy, one has a very poor sperm count, inadequate for natural fertility, but we can offer them fertility very directly now with single sperm microinjection. So this has lowered the bar tremendously to the advantage of our patients. Unfortunately, uh, it does fail on occasion, and one has to consider a diagnostic testicular biopsy if one has a zero sperm count after 18 months of therapy, because there is a higher rate, unfortunately, of primary testicular diseases as well. Uh, unfortunately, you don't only have one problem, you can have two. So there's a need to, to, to undertake a diagnostic biopsy if things are not progressing very well. In some centres, not in our own, and in very few really, there is a role of potentially for pulsatile GnRH therapy for pituitary intact patients, but I don't think that's very widely uh, utilised. What is very interesting uh, biologically uh, is the fact that when you have a second treatment of gonadotropin induction in HH males, they respond more quickly and more profoundly the second time. This is a, a review from Peter Liu uh, from uh, 10 years ago now, which makes this point very clearly. It comes back to the point about pre versus post pubertal onset. If you've ever established metagenesis once, it's quicker and easier to do it a second time. There's an imprinting or a maturational effect which is permanent. This raises an interesting question which came up in a clinical discussion, I think yesterday in one of the meetings, was, was that we should be perhaps reviewing the concept of congenital HH treatment in clinical practice. As that first patient I showed you uh, exemplified, one uses testosterone to simply virilize until fertility is sought, but that could be 10 or 20 years later. That man may not come back until he's 35 wanting to have children. Are we doing the right thing there? Is there in fact a role for a temporarily appropriate use of gonadotropins to mature the testis in mid-puberty when it should occur to maximize the infrastructure for later use? This is eminently testable. We tried in vain to get a large RCT going on this, but there is anecdotal and animal evidence to suggest it would make sense and some preliminary clinical data from Mark Zacharin in Melbourne. So I just put that out there. This is really something that we need to look at seriously. Frustration number one is how little we can contrast this with idiopathic infertility. This is the, the largest body of, of male infertility cases, many of whom are thought to have a primary intrinsic testicular problem or an alleged partial non-classical HH syndrome, if you like, inappropriately normal FSH, what can we do, if anything, for them? Can we manipulate the hormonal milieu to improve their fertility and sperm output, or is it just a waste of time and money? We are not talking about this 
what we have here is a very badly damaged testis, one in which uh, it, it seems pointless to put the accelerator flat to the floor if it's already there at eight units per litre. The car is already stopped or virtually stopped and nothing you can do is going to change the intrinsic defects of this machine. However, in the many other cases, we are talking about normal FSH, uh, and is it possible to manipulate that testis by reducing estradiol feedback through antiestrogens or aromatase inhibitors, or perhaps directly driving the testis with superphysiological levels of HCG or FSH? Well, there's been, uh, it doesn't matter what's in the literature, people will do whatever they think, and uh, this is a fascinating review about the American urological practice. Uh, some 400 urologists responded to this uh, questionnaire about what they would do. Two thirds of them used empirical therapies for three to six months, including clomiphene, HCG and anastrozole, because of the compelling need to do something rather than nothing. Now, I don't have a problem, I guess, with that, except that 10% of them used testosterone. Uh, and as I'll tell you in the second part of my talk, that is a spectacularly bad idea. Uh, so please, you don't do something, just don't do any harm. What do we actually know? Well, <clears throat> uh, a little is the answer. Uh, clomiphene aromatase inhibitors first. The theory is that by relief of estrogen feedback, uh, one uh, may increase FSH LH levels, and also, it's been argued, reduce intracesticular estrogen levels. I find that a little hard to believe, because from our studies, the level of, of estradiol in the human testis is approximately 10,000 picomolar. So it is staggeringly high, uh, and I don't know how you actually go about in inhibiting that. Overall, the data is quite negative, and the, your NICE guidelines say don't bother. I saw a, an interesting uh, and I think quite well done meta-analysis uh, from Andrology last year of the 11 RCTs in which a placebo or no treatment was offered in a total of 900 men with normal FSH and idiopathic infertility for treatments between three and, and, nine and 12 months. Overall, an alleged uh, odds ratio of 2.4 for pregnancy outcome, which achieved significance, with a number to treat of 10, using fairly conventional solid doses of clomiphene and tamoxifen with few or little side effects. So provocative, uh, but not conclusive. Similarly, gonadotropin idiopathic infertility, direct treatment at Cochrane Library Review last year, only six RCTs that met their examination criteria ever performed. Um, and a total of only 460 participants with varying mix match of different protocols. Uh, their conclusion was that there was potentially a, an increase in spontaneous conception, but it was only encouraging in preliminary data. And what pervades this entire area are the fact that there are quite few trials. They're all hopelessly underpowered, varying in design with wide confidence intervals. So we just don't know. But it does make one concerned that we might just be missing something here. Because you see, at the moment, we conflate all of male infertility into the idiopathic uh, category as if we know what we're talking about. We know nothing about what the subgroups are. There may entirely be subgroups of male infertility in whom, if we knew who to treat, we would see a, a therapeutic effect from such manoeuvres. But as we wallow in the ignorance of what actually constructs the different types of male infertility, we make the negative conclusion. I think there is certainly a need for understanding uh, who we can treat and how we could treat them potentially in the future. Now I'd like to just toss the coin and uh, look at the other side. I couldn't resist that. Um, you'll forgive me. Um, male hormonal contraception. I want to uh, scotch a few sort of, uh, you know, publicly uh, promulgated views that men don't care are not involved. Men are currently involved in 30% of family planning. It is an important niche market. There are many couples in whom female methods are, are not able to be tolerated and, and whom they are looking to delay the first child, delay permanent sterility or space children and whom are interested in this, in this uh, area. The WHO identified this as a, as a needs area 30 years ago and to their credit really got the whole area going back in the, in the 1980s. There have been many achievements but the, the frustrations are extreme in this area. And I'll just uh, bring this uh, uh, to your attention. The ideal contraception would meet all of these various uh, criteria, including the fact that it has to be acceptable and effective. And currently, male hormonal methods are the only ones that come close to achieving those other than the condom. The principles, as I, as I outlined before, is to use testosterone to suppress gonadotropins and thereby in, impede uh, the production of both testicular testosterone and sperm. And of course, the testosterone maintains the sexual function of the male it's often given along with progestin for reasons which I'll short, shortly describe. 
The original WHO trials used testosterone, the simple nature's own method, and uh, two very large studies of hundreds of couples around the world uh, led to the conclusion that to get reasonable contraceptive efficacy, the sperm density has to be less than three million per mil, ideally zero, and that in this level of uh, oligospermia, the failure rate was similar to that of real world usage of condoms. This led to the, the notion that less than a million per mil was a working threshold, a sort of a target which may provide uh, superior contraceptive eff efficacy to condoms and similar to female hormonal methods. It became apparent that we have to combine testosterone with something else and predominantly this progestins, uh, antagonists are too expensive, and progestins uh, allow for improved gonadotropin suppression and therefore better rates of azospermia and by sparing the dose of testosterone, avoid the excessive uh, androgen effects which, which troubled the early trials. Uh, we performed the first uh, 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 efficacy study uh, ever on the use of combined testosterone progestin uh, about 10 years ago with David Handelsman in, in Sydney, and it showed it to be very effective uh, and really sent, uh, set the scene for the subsequent trial I'll, I'll talk to you about in just a moment. What happens when you add a DMPA or a progestin and look at the time course here over a period of a few days, compared to testosterone alone in the green, you'll see that uh, the gonotropins fall more quickly and more profoundly with the addition of the, of the progestin. Interestingly, in humans, you get a virtual abolition of LH. You can't really measure it by any method we can find in, the, uh, in such treated men. It's, it's gone. FSH doesn't totally go, and common with other species, there's a level of constitutive FSH secretion which is independent of GnRH, and one has to speculate whether in some individuals one or two percent of FSH may actually do something. What you certainly do is you uh, reduce testicular testosterone enormously. Its normal level is about a thousand uh, nanomolar, it drops to about 40. It drops down toward the blood level, which is about 20 in these men given injections entirely due to the fact that uh, LH has been uh, withdrawn from the Leydig cell. What you see when you do uh, timed um, studies on the dynamics of germ cells, this is actually very technical work and I've just reduced it to one slide here, <clears throat> one sees uh, quantifiable effects on the maturation of uh, early uh, type A to type B somatogonia, uh, reductions in the efficiency of, of myotic uh, division and high rates of apoptosis, uh, inhibition of spermatid development, and uh, all the way toward the end, one sees uh, an abolition of sperm release. Uh, this is a very interesting and unexpected observation that we made, was if you look at these men and the testis man many months after the disappearance of sperm in the semen, you still find 10%, 10% of sperm in the testis. They are still there, but they are no longer released. So I have what I call the, the transit lounge phenomenon here. These poor sperm are trapped in the transit lounge. Uh, they cannot board the plane and leave because the levels of testosterone and FSH won't permit that final expulsion event. What it means for treatment is that you must maintain suppression. You must maintain the foot on the brake all the time. If you let the foot off the brake even for a week, these people will get on the plane and they're out of here and you're in trouble. What, what you see, uh, a couple of uh, obvious questions you ask, how quick? Okay, it takes about uh, three months to get men to uh, half, uh, half the men to the threshold of a million per mil. The rest take about six months. But notice at the top, there's about 5% of recalcitrants who do not suppress. There are these men who we call the non-responding group, and we do not know why. You cannot, it's nothing obvious. It's not drug dose, metabolism, anthropometric measurements, race, endocrine parameters. We've looked, it ain't there. There's no explanation. So they still make sperm uh, even though um, we, we've done the best we can from an endocrine manipulation point of view. And one has to wonder whether this differential between 40 and 20, if 40 nanomolar, which although it's way reduced, is still 40 nanomolar. There may still be some androgen action signaling that way, but it's very uh, difficult to envisage a way in which you could inhibit this without having systemic effects on the man and he would never come back to see you again. So it's a difficult problematic theoretical area. Uh, does it recover? Yes, it does. Uh, the median time to recovery after you stop these medications is a few months. Some men take up to 12 months to recover. And this led to a very large study, and I'll end with a, on a bit of a downer <laughs> and the frustration that we now have. This is a magnificent uh, 
effort organised by the World Health Organisation and CONRAD involving uh, many uh, centres around the world. Uh, your own uh, Fred Wu and Richard Anderson, with whom I, I've worked for many years in this area, and they are real stalwarts of this area, they're involved. David Hounsman and myself in Australia and then other, other folk around the world. And this was a study which envisaged to look at many hundreds of, of couples who would use norethistrone as a progestin and testosterone, a nibido preparation, as the combination. And the protocol was straightforward, uh, six months of suppression of therapy aiming at less than a million, 12 months of efficacy, no other contraception, keep it less than a million, and then recover. The outcomes are suppression of sperm production and efficacy of contraception, no other contraception to be used, very important, obvious endpoint, and the other ones which you could expect are all entirely reasonable. Uh, did we suppress sperm? Absolutely. 96% uh, of men got to less than 1 million per mil. It works very effectively. Those, that non-responding group uh, continue. Uh, does it recover? Yes, it does. Uh, at uh, six months, uh, sorry, at, uh, at a year, 97% uh, had recovered uh, when they lost a follow-up. It was going well. And then, three years ago this month, came the missive for the WHO that an external peer review committee, annual scientific and ethical review, had cancelled the study. They cancelled it because they regarded some significant uh, adverse events and other minor adverse events to represent a risk which is unacceptable in the light of additional benefit from continuation, in their words. Um, what were they concerned about? Uh, they were concerned about uh, disorders of mood, uh, disorders, uh, multiple disorders, uh, including mood, mood problems, uh, changes in sexual drive, hot flushes, listlessness, tachycardia, all sorts of things, uh, acne, uh, panic attack, and in one case, erectile dysfunction. Now, I'll just make the, quote the bleeding obvious. There is no placebo group here. Nobody in this study was getting nothing. They were all getting something to stop them getting pregnant. So you might, your question might be, what's the background rate of these disorders in this demographic of young men over a period of a year or two? One doesn't know, but the study was cancelled nonetheless. So we have very solid outcomes from the study. Efficacy high, uh, suppression high, recovery good, uh, reversibility um, good. Uh, acceptability, very high. 80% of the patients wanted to continue. So why isn't it going anywhere? What's gone on? There have been many agonised reviews about this, uh, how difficult it's been to get engagement for industry and maintain their engage engagement. And so I, I just share the perspectives of a, a good friend of this area, Farid Saad from Bayer, who presented this slide a couple of years ago in Florence, which sort of says the way the drug companies regard this. Uh, they see uh, problems with market size, product positioning, the prospect of abuse, uh, potentially, of the product for its androgen effects, issues of uncertainty about efficacy, uh, regulatory burdens are enormous. Uh, industry, one industry pulled out about four or five years ago, and then with a the WHO cancellation uh, a few years ago, sharing also pulled out. So uh, there's now currently no active drug company involvement. So whilst we are enthusiastic about uh, really where this field had come to, it's going nowhere at the moment. Now, I don't know if that's an overstatement, but certainly this duck uh, is in intensive care um, because um, without any industry funding, uh, with the best of intention, it's hard to know how it's going to go very much further. There are some diehards uh, in the United States, Dyer Blythe, Christina Wang, John Amory, and I think Fred and I and others who are sort of waiting in the wings to see what, how it breaks next, uh, who might uh, still pick the threads of this up. Of course, there are other alternatives in the future. There may be non-hormonal methods, but all of these uh, potential uh, systemic uh, system intervening agents require much more understanding of the physiology, and I think you'll understand that it's many, many years before such things uh, would ever be able to uh, uh, be in the clinic. Uh, one thinks, uh, actually, uh, really, if it uh, when goes back to this uh, the slide here, about how the female hormonal contraception, uh, if it was to be proposed today, might survive the blowtorch of these sorts of considerations. So um, I'd just like to conclude by saying that for HH, we have effective treatment based on sound physiology. For idiopathic infertility, we, we have effective bypass, not treatment, and RCTs are needed in targeted populations. And contraception has sound science, but faces overwhelming difficulties in industry engagement. I'd like to thank you, and uh, I'd like to also, uh, I think, just conclude with one slide in reference to my grandmother, um, I first heard of Liverpool on a crystal radio. Who hands up who ever one even knows what a crystal radio is? Probably only the old folk, yeah, there we go. It was a, before the invention of the transistor. 
Um, I heard about Liverpool, and uh, of course, uh, I have to thank he is somewhat of a pilgrimage to come here after 50 years because my grandmother took them, me to see the Beatles. This is Melbourne in 1964 for my 10th birthday. Now that's what you call a cool grandma. <laughs> thank you.